And so let's turn to that now, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous and godly way in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a special people eager to do good works. Say these things and encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The best thing since sliced bread. We're familiar with that idiom, aren't we? Uh, We know it, uh, we use it. Uh, It means that the thing here in front of me, whatever I've got in my hands connected with that phrase, is just the most amazing thing in the world. The greatest invention since sliced bread. We all use that idiom, that phrase. How often do we stop to think about what it's actually saying? What it's actually revealing? Now, someone accused me of reading too much into this saying this week, but I think it's helpful actually to to think about what that phrase is saying, what it means. Uh, The machines to cut sliced bread on an industrial level were available in 1870. Available in 1870. But they were not commercially profitable because you had to change a whole lot of other things to actually make money off it. You actually had to change the way you cooked bread. So all your loaves were the same size which meant you had to adjust the ovens you were using. You had to actually do it quickly and produce the same loaf every time, so you actually had to change your bread mix. You had to come up with a new type of bread mix. And then at the other end, you had to reinvent all your appliances, like your toasters and your toasted sandwich makers and all those kinds of things, so they could fit that slice of bread in. A whole lot of things had to happen for sliced bread to be sold and for you to make a profit. And finally, in July 1929, what's that, 59 years? July 1929, the first commercially pre-sliced bread was sold in Missouri, and the world was never the same again, was it? That phrase was not used until 1951, the best thing since sliced bread, and it was actually used to describe the effect a British actor, Stuart Granger, had on the young ladies in the audience at his films. But do you see what that idiom's actually saying? The whole world has been affected by something in the past. Something in the past, the invention and mass production of sliced bread transforms the present and then when you think about how we use that phrase, actually affects the way we look to the future because we're always looking for the next greatest thing, aren't we? The thing that will replace sliced bread. So an event in the past has radically transformed the present and changed the way we wait for the future. Now, that's just sliced bread. And the outcome wasn't really that great. I read another article this week that said when they came to restore the Sistine Chapel ceiling painting the latest time, the best sponge they could find was Wonder White, which tells you about the nutritional value of that sliced bread. (laughs) But what happens if there was actually something better than Wonder White? Something more significant that so radically transformed and disrupted all of life that things were actually better. What happened if there was an event like that? And today we're going to look at that event together. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It's the greatest thing since before sliced bread. It's the greatest thing ever. It's the revelation of your nature in words, every single word. And we pray that you'll apply to us today and change us. Help us to look at the past, present and future in a radically different way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. I think we've actually come uh, to, to use an image. We've come to the beating heart of this letter in these verses. Uh, they're magnificent. Uh, let me just quickly recap. Uh, Paul's had a mission and a message. Remember that? Uh, the message is the truth that leads to godliness, that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose 
for our sins according to God's plan. The whole mission that he's on about is to take this news to the world, starting with God's people. That's God's plan. And it offers life as God designed it and desired it. That's Paul's mission and message. Titus has been left in Crete. He's been left there to appoint elders, leaders amongst God's mob. They're chosen by character, displayed in capacity in their own households. And they're responsible for God's household. They're to feed the sheep and shoot the wolves, aren't they? Remember that? And they're to do that with sound teaching, that truth about Jesus Christ. There are false teachers. They threaten whole households. They threaten God's household. And as we saw last week, their deeds expose their doctrine and they display what they hold dear themselves, their bank accounts, their own reputation. And God's household is to be the same, deeds and doctrine displaying who they serve, but to be radically different. Remember we saw that last week when we looked at what is consistent with sound teaching, those five different groups in God's household, the older men and younger men, older women, younger women, the slaves or employees, an immensely practical description of the godliness that comes from the truth, the deeds and doctrine going hand in hand to display that God is our saviour. And Titus has been given the job to teach this. Look there in verse 1 of Titus 2, but you must speak or proclaim what is consistent with sound teaching. Down in verse 15, uh, proclaim these things and encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. See the word proclaim in both those in your pew Bibles? It might be speak or say if you've got another translation. They're exactly the same command. Two bookend commands reminding Titus of his job. Proclaim what is consistent with sound teaching and proclaim the sound teaching itself. And if you look there in verse 15, he's to do that with confidence and without compromise. Uh, His confidence lies in his authority. Paul has been commissioned by God for this job. Remember chapter 1, verses 1 to 3? Paul has then given the job to Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 2, verse 1. And so when Titus stands up to proclaim this truth to God's mob wherever they meet in Crete, he's doing so as a man commanded, commissioned by God. He has authority. Listen to him. It's not his own proclamation. It's not his own teaching. It's not his own message. It is of and from God. Listen to him if he is proclaiming these things. He's to speak without compromise. He's going to encourage some and rebuke others based on that sound teaching. The sound teaching, that truth that God our Saviour dwells in God's people. That is to be formative on all of God's people and all that they do. It's to shape them as individuals. It's to form them as a household. Anything not focused on that, confront it. Reconfigure it. Anything that is focused on that, encourage it. Now, if you remember this letter, it's a personal letter from Paul to Titus. So this is an encouragement for Titus. He's not from Crete. He's a newcomer to town. He's going to ruffle some feathers. He's going to reorganise some kingdoms because that's what the sound teaching and what's consistent with it, that's what it does. But Titus, don't be discouraged. Don't be dissuaded. Be confident. Speak without compromise. But remember too that this is a letter for us, isn't it? Remember that plural last phrase in the book which suddenly goes to use Or when an elder gets up to do this, to proclaim what is consistent with sound teaching and to proclaim the sound teaching, listen to them. Hear the rebuke. Grab hold of the encouragement. Well, if if that's how Titus is to go about the job, the encouragement, the command, then, then what is the sound teaching that he's to proclaim that underpins everything we just saw last week? What's that sound teaching? Well, put simply, it's this. It's an event in the past that shapes the present and forms the future. An event in the past that shapes the present and forms the future. There is an indisputable event that's taken place. I'm at point three on the outline. It's greater than sliced bread. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, 
with salvation for all people. The, the four at the start, here's the sound teaching that underpins what's consistent. Here's the engine that drives verses 2 to 10. Here's the why for that behaviour for those five groups. I think it's important at this point to notice that verse 11 goes with verse 14. They kind of mirror each other. Verse 14 works as a kind of, as a summarising statement, but it also explains the three key phrases in verse 11. The grace of God has appeared. Something's taken place. Not deserved, not earned, not warranted, perhaps not even expected. It's grace. God's undeserved mercy and kindness. It's of God. Notice it's not from God. Notice it's not by God. Notice that it's of God. It's out of him. It's part of his nature, part of who God himself is, and it's appeared. It's a great word, appeared. It says that you can taste, touch, hear, smell, and measure it. It's come into the world, in this world. It can be verified. God has done something here in this world that the world does not deserve And it is undeniable. It's not an inanimate, impersonal substance like we heard taught before the Reformation. If you look down in verse 14, we're told what this grace is. You see there in verse 14, he, it's a person. It's a human being. And that human being is Jesus Christ, a real historical figure. And when the grace of God appears, it brings salvation. That's the second phrase. It achieves something. It works something. It saves people. And again, verse 14 gives us an explanation. Look there in verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to cleanse for himself a special people. Here's grace and its effect. Jesus gave himself for us. Remember, he lived, died and rose. He did it for humans. Why? Look there in verse 14. To redeem us, to buy us back. Why? Because we were involved, look there in verse 14, in all lawlessness. It doesn't always look that way, does it? We love an ordered society. But put simply, humans like you and me have decided that we can live life without God with us as God. And as you've heard me say a number of times, that creates a world full of how many gods? Billions of gods. And once you put billions of gods into one little world, what kind of world do you get? A mess. A broken world. A world where my laws compete with your laws, where my desires butt against your desires. And what that ends up doing is it doesn't enrich life, does it, even though we think it does, it actually reduces life. So life is a fight for survival. Me getting what I want against you getting what you want. And that's a lawless world in the big scheme of things. It's separated humans from God because we want to be God. It's brought us under God's judgment because we've said we can do better without him and it leads to God giving us what we want. If you want life without me, you can have life without me forever, which is death. And it's what awaits all of us. And the remarkable thing is God has committed because of his very own nature of God to deal with that for us, even if we don't know we need it. Jesus lives for us with God as God. Jesus stands in for us, taking our judgment for us. Jesus rises from the dead to show that he has paid the price for our judgment. He redeems us. Which brings us to the third phrase in verse 11 about this event in the past. It's for all people. Now again, verse 14 helps us, doesn't it? And it picks up the ideas from chapter 1, verse 1. It's for all of God's mob. 
all of God's special people. Jesus has achieved salvation for the people of God so that there is a community in the world that says to the world, hey, there's a better way. There's a greater way. There's a non-broken way of having life that isn't just about survival and breathing, but it lasts forever. What's happened has happened. That's an idiom we use, isn't it? What's happened has happened. What's the case here? Nothing nothing can undo this. (laughs) It's a historical reality. In Jesus, God created his household. That's happened. Anyone who has heard that truth, trusted in that truth, is part of God's household undeniably, irreversibly. But what does that lead to? On that point four on the on the outline, it, it actually leads to a certain life in the present. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, verse 12, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The heart of this, well, it's there in verse 12, to live, to live. That's the focus of these verses. Uh, To live means to say no, to say yes, and to wait. To live is to say no, to say yes, and to wait. It's to say yes to something greater than just breathing and surviving. That's what true life's all about. True life is more than breathing and surviving, more than just imposing your godness on the person next door and vice versa. A real life, if you look there in verse 12, real life is to consider life. It's to be sensible. It's to live life in line with its design, righteous. And it's to reflect the author of life to the world, godly. That's what life's about. It's to consider life. It's to live life as it was designed and it's to reflect the author of life to the world. True life like that can be enjoyed now. Not just then, not just in those glory days back there, but now. It's what it means to be in God's household. A true life also means saying no. That's a yes, isn't it? And it also means saying no. It's to utterly deny and turn away from a life that is just breathing and surviving. Now, our world dresses that up, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, it, puts a, uh, it puts a few baubles in there, some jewellery. It shines it up and says, this is life. But really, when you think about it, life like that with me as God is really just surviving based on the next thing. Uh, the Puritans described it as worldliness. It's to say no to that to the way the world defines life based on, well, the next greatest thing since sliced bread. It's godless because it replaces God with the image of God, doesn't it? With me. It's a life driven by temporary passion and lust for things that are measured against sliced bread (laughs) because they're the next greatest. And again, we have an explanation of that in verse 14, don't we? True life, real life, is to be someone who's been saved from being God to knowing God. It's to be cleansed. It's to be set aright. It's to be so connected with Jesus that life is about displaying him to the world. It's about him saying, they're mine, and us saying, he is mine. And it leads to waiting well, not just living in the present, but waiting well, waiting for the glory days. Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We live now shaped by an event in the past, waiting for an event in the future. We're awaiting people, 
waiting for Jesus to return, to appear again. Most things in our world are defined by waiting, aren't they? When's this sermon going to end? When's the HSC going to finish? When will I get that promotion? When can I buy that vehicle? When's my next holiday? When will I buy that next purchase? Those events that we're waiting for will shape us, won't they? But the problem with all of them is that they're transient and temporary because we then need to move on to the next greatest thing since sliced bread, don't we? And that's how our life gets meaning. That's not how God's household waits. We wait for one thing, don't we? We wait for one event. The first appearing of Jesus changed history. The second appearing of Jesus will end history. And we live between those two great bookends, shaped by this appearing and waiting for that one as we live now. And on that day when Jesus does reappear, and he will, the whole world will see him as he truly is the most significant thing, person, being in all of history. As one person in our Bible study group said it this week, on that day the world will go, ah, that's who we forgot. But it will be too late, won't it? It will be too late. So how do we have that kind of waiting between those two bookends? Well, look there again, verse 14 explains it. Eager or zealous to do good works. So consumed by wanting to represent God to the world that we're looking for the next thing, not since sliced bread, but the next thing that will represent him, show him to the world. And so our waiting is actually characterised in a funny way by busyness, a busyness to represent God our Saviour. In what we do, what we say. Now, notice how I said that. A busyness to represent God our Saviour, not to make God our Saviour. A busyness to represent God our Saviour. Constantly living in deeds that show God's our Saviour. Constantly living in practice, proclaiming that God is our Saviour. Waiting for Jesus to return. The best thing since sliced bread. Now the last point on the outline. Are we familiar with that in here? We'll probably use it sometime in the next week, month, maybe. An event in the past has transformed our present and changed the way we wait for the future. Is there anything more substantial than wonder why? Well, there is. We've just looked at it, haven't we? Last week we saw the teaching that was consistent with this truth. Now we see that truth. We're being pushed to ask about the why and the what of the truth of Jesus impacting on us. Now we could apply this in a number of different ways. But I want to do it by asking two simple questions. The first is this. What event in your past defines your present? What event in your past defines your present. We are defined by our past, aren't we? The past. And so this question is actually asking, what event in the past shapes you as an older man or an older woman, as a younger man or a younger woman, or as an employee? For some of us, that might mean that we have unthoughtfully become sliced bread people. We're defined by something as banal as sliced bread and that shapes our present and future in a worldly way. If we're in this group, we're confronted by the immensity of Jesus, the greatness of God's grace that comes into the world that actually makes everything pale into insignificance because our sin has been dealt with in this man. Now, if we're this kind of person, the worldly lusts and desires that drive us materially and emotionally and relationally, 
Well, held up against Jesus, they're exposed, aren't they? As temporary balms when true life is actually on offer. For some of us, it might be a far more painful question, a question that raises issues and moments which have defined us from our past by crippling us or by jailing us. For this group, as we look at the immensity and wonder of Jesus, we can be cleansed, can't we? We can be liberated. We can be transformed and comforted as the one who says, come to me all who are broken and weary, and Jesus will give you life as it should be, defined by him in the past, by grace and salvation. In him you can have wholeness, life as it was intended. For some of us when we ask this question, oh, we've just never really thought about it. We're just happy floating along, aren't we? We've not really actually paused to consider life. And so the immensity of Jesus, the reality of that event, should actually shock us into self-reflection and a realising that life is more than just floating along, breathing. For some of us, when we ask that question, we are defined God willing, consciously and completely by Jesus, by that event in the past. And for that group, as we see again the immensity of Jesus, of God of himself in the world, for that group, please stay with grace. Don't go beyond it. Don't cheapen it. But please stick with it. Well, that question leads to a second question. Has the truth about Jesus so grabbed you that you wait well? That you are defined by a zealous desire for good deeds that show God? Really, it's a question that asks, what grabs you? What excites you? What drives you? Uh, If you have been grabbed by that grace by Jesus giving of himself for you, then please live that. Live a life defined by grace for good deeds that represent God that don't aim to get his favour. And let those good deeds always reflect the very same grace we have received, undeserved, unwarranted. Uh, If you are grabbed by that grace, by Jesus giving of himself for you, then please submit all of your life to that grace. Did you notice that in verse 11? Who is our teacher? For the grace of God has appeared instructing us. It's God's grace that instructs us. As Jesus sent the disciples out in Matthew 28, 28, go and command everything that I've commanded you. Go and teach that. So please submit every part of your life to him if you've been grabbed by that grace, your career, your leisure choices, your education, your marriage, your parenting, your retirement, your sport, all of it. It's here that we come face to face with that driving force for the deeds we looked at last week. Do our deeds display grace? As I live as an older man, as an older woman, as I live as a younger man, as a younger woman, as I live as an employee, who am I? Am I defined by grace? And does that display what I'm waiting for? the glorious appearing of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, thanks for this. Oh, we could use all sorts of images, couldn't we, Father? Thanks for this engine, this beating heart, this drive that we hear explained as you show us the sound teaching about Jesus, that event in the past that radically shapes the present as we wait for his reappearing in the future. 
Uh, Father, you know where each of us is today. You know where each of us has been and what our weeks will hold. We pray that we will be a people who are so grabbed by grace in Jesus that that defines our present as we wait for his return, zealously looking for good deeds that display you. Father, whether we're an older man or an older woman, a younger man or a younger woman, whether we're an employer, Father, help us to be so grabbed by that grace, that undeniable reality that your household lives in a way to show you our saviour to this world. Father, we pray that through this you'll bring others to know this event in the past that gives true life in the present as we wait for him to return and live eternally with him. Amen.